Good afternoon, everyone. We're so glad to have you with us and wherever you are located, um, we are, are really pleased you're with us. It may be afternoon where you are. It may be early midday. So uh, the point is, is that we're so glad that you are with us and you care about this conversation on today. It's critically important. And for all of you taking the time to do it, we're, we're so incredibly uh, grateful to you for doing it. Um, uh, this is a, a moment in time where this is a very important discussion uh, for, our, uh, for our community and for everyone in the community. Um, and to be able to have this discussion and to make the difference uh, will take all of us. So with that said, I'd like to pass the baton and uh, begin the program. Beautiful. Thank you, Mr. Dan Gillison, the CEO of yes. BAMI. Welcome to Lift Every Voice, a call to action to promote the mental health of the Black family. In this inaugural town hall is co-hosted by the Steve Fund, and our great partners, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI. The Steve Fund is the nation's leading organization supporting the mental health and emotional well-being of people of color, especially young people. To learn more about the Steve Fund, just go to stevefund.org. In May of 2021, the Steve Fund and NAMI began a partnership, and they forged a bond to bring increased mental health to the Black family and other families of color. Both organizations are solutions oriented, committing to using new communications and technologies. We're Zooming right now with over 400 people, right? And we wanna amplify and focus on the urgent call to better mental health across the nation. During this town hall, Lift Every Voice, you'll hear from experts and advocates who will enlighten us with vital information on mental health and mental illness in communities of color. They will share their knowledge about how to use the full range of the tools that we have developed, how to get mental health care, how to get psychiatric treatment, find out about support groups and other resources so we can help make Black families thrive. You know, families are everything. They're the first line of defense when it comes to attending to our own mental wellness and the emotional needs of young people of color. We want to thank you for joining us, as Dan mentioned, and the Steve Fund has a special thanks and a shout out to Janssen Pharmaceuticals of Johnson & Johnson. We're kicking off this town hall with an interview we did with Mark Morial. Mark Morial has been described as one of those special leaders who possesses both street smarts and boardroom savvy. He's the current president and CEO of the iconic National Urban League, the nation's largest historic civil rights and urban, urban advocacy organization. He served as the highly successful and popular mayor of New Orleans, as well as the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. He was previously a Louisiana state senator and ran a high-powered law practice in New Orleans for many years. Mark Morial is a leading voice on the national stage in the battle for jobs, education, housing, and voting rights equity. As a graduate of Georgetown University Law Center, go Hoyas! He's been recognized as one of the 100 most influential Black Americans by Ebony Magazine, and one of the top 50 nonprofit leaders by the Nonprofit Times, and one of the 100 most influential Black lawyers in America. He's also been inducted into the International Civil Rights Walk of Fame in Atlanta, Georgia. Be sure to visit that when you're in town. So let's cut to that interview right now. I'm thrilled to be with Mark, and I want to dig in and ask, Mark, as you think about mental health and mental wellness. Why is it so important that we think about the social determinants of health, like employment, education, housing, food security, and all that, as we think about Black families? It's alarming and it's troubling, but think of what we've been through in the last 20 years. Number one, there was 9-11. Number two, there was the Great Recession. B, uh, the Great Recession took away people's jobs, uh, many people and many families lost their homes to foreclosure. Uh, the Great Recession was followed by uh, challenges like hurricanes, Superstorm Sandy in the Northeast, uh, and other factors. Then we realization of the attempt to normalize racism and hatred. All of these things, our young people follow the news, they watch television, they're on social media. All of these factors create an environment uh, that says maybe to young black people, you're not respected, you're not wanted, you're not honored, you're not worthy. And all of that creates 
uh, stress, which induces uh, mental, emotional, and social challenges. What's so important about this is in the Black community, we have to raise awareness about mental health and not just, uh, he crazy, uh, she crazy, uh, if I say I've got mental challenges, I am demonstrating some level of weakness or some lack of strength and resiliency. Uh, we have to raise awareness because only by being aware can we intervene. Uh, parents and grandparents and caregivers, pay attention to your children, pay attention to their moods, uh, be attentive and attuned uh, to the challenge. Uh, and we also have to learn how to be aware and to be aware of and to learn the warning signs and the challenge signs uh, for our children. While the National Urban League doesn't work directly uh, on mental health, as you said, we work on the social determinants and we are a proponent of people being aware uh, and educated about their own health, their own family's health, the health of their loved ones. And number two, uh, accessing experts, doctors. And so there's a whole, if you will, community of mental health professionals. Some are psychologists, others are uh, psychiatrists, uh, others are mental health counselors. Uh, we need more resources in the community so that there can be more interventions and more access uh, to those in the community that are becoming aware, they become aware uh, of these mental uh, and emotional health ch health challenges. Well, I'm on the Mark Morial framework. You even had a little alliteration going on. Awareness, be attuned, right? Attentiveness, understand what's going on. And then using education, become aware of how you can deeply understand it to move toward action and then lay out the action plan. I, I think that if you understand this, why can't we just get it done? Is there some political aspect to it? We, we have to... Reduce the stigma, the, uh, the stigma of mental health uh, illness, the stigma of mental health crises and challenges. We have to reduce the stigma. It's rampant in the black community. Let's not, you know, just be polite about it. Let's confront it. We've got to confront that. And because our experience in this country has been an experience of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of slavery and segregation and racism. We are resilient, strong, tough people who are used to riding the roller coaster, who are used to the storms and the tsunamis, who are used to difficult challenges, who are used to witnessing violence. So we're tough and we're strong and maybe sometimes when you're so tough and you're so strong, you miss the signals, you miss the signs, you miss the interventions, but these I rise, this rise. I hear you. You know, this rise among our children is particularly troubling. Uh, and all of us uh, adults and fathers and mothers and grandfathers and grandmothers and aunts and uncles and, and, and guardians and uh, uh, play uncles and play aunties, mm -hmm. we got to be attuned mm -hmm. uh, to our young people and not miss the signals and miss the signs and then intervene. There are many, many resources hotlines that you can call to get confidential information, uh, information on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on the internet to help you maybe guide you to the right resources in your community. So uh, I just feel what the Steve Fund and Amy are doing, uh, let's work to raise this awareness. Let's work to raise, uh, eliminate the stigma. Let's work to raise uh, the need for us to, to intervene. How do we support the National Urban League to reach our optimal position, our optimal community structure. You know, the National Urban League, we are active in uh, helping young people uh, get through high school, get through middle school, uh, go on to college through our dynamic after school programs. Uh, we are a huge proponent of helping people get access to insurance and Medicaid and affordable care uh, and Medicare. We are active in, in helping to enroll and sign people up for those very important programs through job training. One of the things uh, we learned a few years ago through conversations with my, uh, with my own team who work in the workforce and job training area, 
was how uh, mental health challenges affected uh, people's, some people's ability to be consistent in attending job training sessions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And somehow uh, we noticed uh, some attendance issues and people would automatically think, well, they must have transportation. They must have challenges with families and children. And th but then some of the folks said, well, you know, I think we see something else going on, right? We see uh, some depression, some mental health challenges, which is affecting their ability to be able to perform on a consistent basis. Uh, there's so much people can do to support us, but what we want to do is lend our voice and our platform to increasing awareness. Uh, we, uh, you know, we have to talk about this in communities and the more I become aware of it, uh, the more I become aware of, uh, of, of, of the factors in the science to be able to recognize it. And uh, as people in the community, we have to recognize it in ourselves. We have to recognize it in our loved ones. If you have a CDC that has declared that racism is a serious public health threat, and they understand it holds you back from job training, and they hold they understand it holds you back from living in a way that is you know truly uplifting, economically uplifting, and building community. Does that help? Do all municipalities, Look, do many municipalities, understand this issue? Or they I don't think you know, Gordon. I don't think people understand it. But the fact that the CDC has acknowledged it, uh, that provides an opening. See, I think what we, you got to, some people say, racism is a public health problem. What do you mean by that? I thought public, public health meant a cold, cough, COVID, or cancer. Uh, we don't tend to relate to the fact that uh, our mental and emotional being is part of our health as well, see? And I think what CDC's pronouncement does is it promotes an opportunity for a deeper conversation and understanding in our community. So look, pastors mm -hmm. who, who work in this space, who provide counseling in this space can be very important voices, elected officials, uh, teachers, professors, and others, uh, respected voices. We have to understand this, uh, if we are going to lift up the proper types of interventions. And, you know, it's interesting how uh, during COVID, we became separated from each other from an interpersonal point. Some people became very isolated. Uh, maybe they lived alone. Maybe they lived in an apartment. Maybe they were in a crowded city. Uh, and, and sometimes just the interactivity with others is an important way of, uh, of, uh, of, of helping us uh, sometimes cope, uh, sometimes confront, sometimes uh, uh, help us deal with some of the challenges uh, that we indeed face. So I just believe, you know, I do not position myself, assert today, suggest that I am a mental health professional. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I don't, I don't, I'm just, uh, a person. I'm a dad. You know. I'm a husband. I'm a. I'm a. I'm a uncle. I'm a play uncle. <laughs> you know. Uh, to a lot of people, I, and and I have a lot of a lot of great people who work with me, work for me, interact. And I just feel it, I have to be uh, better, better skilled, tuned, and aware of this. And from a national urban league pers perspective, we are looking at more ways that we can. Uh, uh, talk more. Some of our youth programs now uh, are leaning in the direction of also trying to help address the social, emotional, and mental well-being of children. So this is a this is a transition uh, across the board as we all become more aware of this problem. Well, that is a wonderful remembrance for me. My time with Mark Morial. I want to thank him. And I can't wait to get to an action-packed program with Dan Gillison, the CEO of NAMI. I know you, you got the experts that Mark was talking about. We've got the talented, uh, brilliant people. I see Anel Prim in our midst. There's lots of folks who have the power to bring real intelligent courses of action to this, this crisis. And I'm excited to give it to you, Dan, to bring us this wonderful program today. Thank you, uh, Gordon. I want to thank you and, and, and um, um, uh, Mayor, uh, former mayor and current president and CEO, Mark Morial, for those opening comments and for that uh, that uh, piece there, uh, uh, that interview. Um, 
I actually just picked up his book, uh, The Gumbo Coalition. And I'm going to start uh, and I'll go off script for just a minute because this is important. In The Go Gumbo Coalition, uh, what um, uh, Mayor Morial speaks about is the 10 leadership lessons that help you inspire, unite, and achieve. And, and I think it's important to start there because he talks about how he compares good leadership to a good, good pot of gumbo. And he says, creating gumbo as it relates to leadership is about building a coalition of unique ingredients or communities, each with unique skills, points of view, and flavors, each crucial in its own way. So this is where I'm going to break apart for just a second before I pass the baton. Um, you know, gumbo is starts with a wonderful root. And then what you put in it is you put in the sausage, you put shrimp, you put chicken, you put crab. Uh, uh, and, 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 and But that gumbo will not be good if it's not a good roux. And I actually look at the roux as partnerships. And, 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 and you have to partner uh, to, to make it a, a good gumbo. You can throw the, the, all the different meats in it, all the different types of things, including the vegetables, but if you don't have a good roux. And where I'm going with that is you, you can't be transactional, you have to be strategic. And that's what partnerships allow us to do. And I love the quote that he, he offered to us about the unique skills, points of view, flavors, and, and, and crucial in its own way. Uh, because it embodies what we're trying to do here at NAMI with our partnerships. Our partnerships help diversify our perspective and elevate our collective consciousness on matters related to culture and mental health. And in a time where the mental health co uh, 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 of communities of color are being dispor uh, disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, cultural stigma, and systematic inequities, our partnership with the Steve Fund and commitment to supporting Black families is more important now than ever. Now, Families have always been a focus for NAMI. Our organization was founded 42 years ago by moms looking for resources for their families. Families are on the front line in promoting the mental health of our children and our communities. And as we have continued to see rates of suicide for Black youth increase, the expertise the Steve Fund offers as the nation's leading organization focused on supporting the mental health and emotional well being of young people of color is truly invaluable. Together, we hope that we can combine our organization's expertise to support the mental health of Black families everywhere. We really appreciate you being here at the town hall today and joining us in amplifying the mental health needs of young people of color and their families. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Nell Prem, the Steve Fund's Senior Medical Director to talk more about the mental health needs of Black families and set the stage for our panel discussion. Dr. Prem? Thank you so much, Dan, for your kind introduction. Uh, I would like to set the stage by talking about mental health in the Black community. Um, one in six Black adults experienced a mental illness in the past year, and only one in three Black adults who need mental health care receive it, compared to more than half of whites and 47% of Hispanics. Black adults in the United States are more likely than white adults to report persistent symptoms of emotional distress, such as sadness and feeling like everything is an effort. Nearly one in four young black adults, 18 to 24 years old, experienced a mental illness in the past year. Among black youth with major depression, 36% received treatment compared to 50% of white youth. And among Black high school students, both girls and boys are significantly more likely than whites to, ascend, to attempt suicide, and rates are even higher among young people in the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community. There are many examples of mental health disparities in the Black community. Less outpatient care, early treatment dropout, more inpatient and involuntary care that is coerced and forced later treatment entry at the crisis stage from emergency rooms, which are not good places to receive one's mental health care. They're more likely to be misdiagnosed with illnesses such as schizophrenia and of mood disorders, and less likely to receive guideline consistent care or quality care. They're underrepresented in research, which means that we don't know if the new treatment or approach is really applicable uh, to the Black community, and, and finally, a lack of Black mental health professionals. 
And on top of all of that, COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on Black families with higher death rates and significant economic and educational challenges and fallout. Physical distancing as a precaution of COVID-19 prevented us from engaging in in-person fellowship, which is so much a part of our culture and our faith community. About 40% of us uh, experienced stress, anxiety, or great sadness uh, as a result of COVID-19. And there was also a rise in suicide that was seen among Black people in certain jurisdictions. And then there's racial trauma. We saw a 5% rise in anxiety or depression the week after the video of George Floyd's death uh, was shared. And, and this equals 1.4 million more people uh, who were impacted. And after police shootings, higher levels of psychological distress are seen in Black uh, versus white people, sometimes in the same community. So I'd like to leave you with some key messages. There is no health without mental health. Racism is real, xenophobia is real, and these can have a negative impact on mental health. Mental illness is real, and mental illness is not a weakness or a failure of faith. You do not have to suffer in silence. Help is available, treatment works, culture counts, especially when you're choosing what mental health professional you're going to go to, and recovery is possible. And since risk factors are not predictive factors because of protective factors, we must take a preventive approach with self-care and mental health promoting action to protect the mental health of Black families. Seek help early for the best outcome. Use a full range of mental health support services and psychiatric treatment options. Seek help from practitioners who are culturally humble and use a strengths-based trauma-informed, recovery-oriented, and healing-centered approach. Mm. And so you might ask, why did we entitle today's program Lift Every Voice? Because mental health is everyone's business. We invite everyone on this town hall to join our community of action to elevate the mental health of Black families. Here's what you can do. Put mental health on the top of your family's agenda. Share the information you receive from this town hall with your family and friends. It starts with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Prim. We appreciate you. We appreciate um, your, um, your counsel um, and your insight. And um, we're going to get into the panel now. And, and getting into the panel, it's, it, this is what you came here for. We're so excited we, we're, we're, because we're almost at 500. Uh, participants, and that is outstanding. And we need you all to be a force multiplier. Uh, as Dr. Prem said, there is no physical health without mental health. So it's 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 the total body. So we need to be thinking that way. We need to be working that way and operationalize everything we can. And getting into the panel, uh, let's start by some introductions. And uh, in terms of those introductions, I'd like to have each of our panelists to introduce themselves and say a little bit about uh, their body of work. And um, uh, we'll start with uh, 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 Dr. Napoleon Higgins, Dr. Higgins. Hi, my name is Dr. Napoleon Higgins. I'm in private practice in Houston, Texas. I'm also executive director of the Black Psychiatrists of America, an organization formed in 1969 to address the mental health needs and the professional needs of, of Black psychiatrists and uh, Black people. So I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to share more uh, when we do the question and answer. All right, thank you. Um, let's move on to J.B. Moore. J.B.? Yes, thank you, Dan, and good afternoon, everyone. I am serving currently as the executive director for NAMI Prince George's County. I am a family member and guardian of a loved one living with a serious mental illness, and I'm just happy to um, serve today. Thank you, JB. Um, Harold Turner. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for this terrific and informative program. I'm the executive director of NAMI Urban Los Angeles. Uh, I'm also a board member for our state organization, the um, NAMI California organization, and I sit on the Mental Health Commission for the County of Los Angeles. And uh, as you said, I guess we can get into more questions and answers later. Thank yeah, you. Thank, yeah, thank you, Harold, and we will. Dr. De, De, Janice Beal. Good afternoon, everyone. Now, the nun called me Janice when I was in trouble, so 
pronounce it Janice. So <laughs> let's let's start with that. Um, my name is Dr. Janice Beal, and I'm a Houstonian, and I'm a clinician in Houston, Texas. I'm in private practice, but I am also a mental health expert for the Steve Fund. So I have been running a phenomenal program called Wellbeing in Color, and I look forward to being able to share that with the audience so they'll know what we're doing and how we're addressing adolescents uh, and talking about to remove some of the stigma of mental health and mental illness. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of today's program, for sharing additional information with you. Janice, so so good to meet you. And it's, it's kind of like me when, when, when there's something where I'm in trouble, someone says Daniel. So I'm just Dan. So let me get your name right, Janice. So okay. you're in Harris County and you're in Houston. So I, I think that uh, uh, you have a, a colleague there in Dr. Napoleon Higgins in Texas. So uh, that's that, that's fantastic. So let me start with you. Um, you have been conducting uh, Steve Fund Wellbeing in Color Mental Health Education Workshops and Support Groups for Young People in Houston and uh, New York City. What have what have you been hearing from young people who have attended these programs? Well, actually, I've heard very positive things because what we open up is talking about mental health. And we talk about telling them we want to inform them to remove the stigma. Mm -hmm. So we kind of go through different modules that we have. We have five modules. And the very first module talks about where does stigma actually start? And why is it that we all, even though we live in different households, we all have the same idea and concept that we're not to talk about how we're feeling. We're not to talk about things that are going on, because if we do, we'll get in trouble whether it's mm -hmm. our parents, whether it's our grandparents. And having gone through the pandemic, so many things happened to so many adolescents that they didn't have a chance to, or saw that was coming, that they're trying to understand how to process everything they knew stopped. Um, they didn't have proms, they didn't have graduations. Um, they just didn't, they weren't able to be with their friends. So yeah. socially and emotionally, our kids kind of stopped like a year and a half ago. So they're going back to school this year in the grade that they should be in, but emotionally they are back a little bit younger. So our ninth graders are not really looking like ninth graders or our 10th graders are not looking because socially and emotionally they haven't gotten to that space. So mm -hmm. they realize that they have some things that they've dealt with and things that they want to talk about and immediately they start opening up and talking about how they're feeling. And once we give them a safe space to talk about that, they're just telling us all types of things. I mean, at first, maybe the first 10 to 15 minutes is kind of quiet, but after that, each time we come together, they're sharing. So, so far we've been able to reach over 400 kids. Um, we give them information on how the brain works, how it affects us emotionally, the different types of mental illnesses that there are. We also leave them with, we also do a part on racism and how that played a, a part while they were in the pandemic. What happened to them? What were their mm. thoughts and concerns by watching all of the things that happened on television? And how did they feel? And a lot of kids have a lot of things to share about their own personal experiences. So they get a chance to talk about that. And then we leave them with ways in order to cope with the stress they experience. Because we know the trauma, if you don't treat trauma, it just continues about you know, to get on top of each other and the next thing happens and the next thing happens. So we want them to be able to talk. We want them to be able to share. And the, the you know, the positive feedback that we've gotten has been phenomenal. We've had groups where they've become very emotional because we didn't know what they were going to share with us. And we've been able to process that by having no help experts there. And the key factor to our program is that we have peer counselors. So we train peers to be a part of the program. So they're there with the mental health professional. And so therefore, they were, it's like a co-presenting co type of activity. Yes. So their peers is telling them, you know, different things and what they look to us. And we kind of give additional information and additional guidance. But the peer counselors have made a difference. And I think that's very important because they're, they, too, are sharing how they felt and how things have affected them during the pandemic and where they are right now. So we've got nothing but positive feedback. Um, and so we're, we're doing them in the schools. And mm -hmm. so it's just making a, a difference. Um, it's truly making a difference. Because if you look at their what they've written back, I was like, wow. And the best thing I heard was that my mental health is just as important as my physical health. And when one student took that away, I, I knew we had done a good job. Yep, that's fantastic, Janice. Thank you very much, and that's uh, great. And 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 I was going to ask you if uh, the peers were involved, and if so, how. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so appreciate it. Um, uh, let me ask uh, um, um, uh, Napoleon a question. Based on your experience, Napoleon, on of providing mental health services and psychiatric care to the Black community, what are some of the most common mental health conditions and mental illnesses that you treat? 
um, um, would love to, to, to get your insight on that. Well, you know, I want to thank, thank Steve Fon and Nami for having me here. And, and as Anel has stated uh, very eloquently about the disparities in care and treatment that we face uh, as a community, um, when you look at our children uh, and our community, a lot of issues you see with anxiety, a lot of issues with depression. And as Mayor Morial has stated, the issue of stigma, keeping people from moving forward and bringing that information to others is a, is a serious issue. And one thing I'll, and I'll do is, is take it back. And when I say back, I'm referring way back even to slavery, where we as a people could not talk about the pains that we were going through and that you're just trying to make it through every day. The issue of you know Jim Crow and the current issues of, slave, uh, of, of racism, that all impacts us even more so. So on top of just being human and having the risk of mental health issues, the issue of all those other things and that generational pain is something that continues to come forward. And honestly, I think a lot of that has to do with, a lot of that has to do with the silence and the current issues of stigma that we have today. And that when you know of the pain and you've seen the pain in your family and it's generational pain, and then you still continue to face it, so often we don't want to talk about it. We just want to hide it in order to suppress it so that we can move, move forward. But the fact is that not addressing your pain does not help it get better. You know, it's important to make sure that we recognize what's going on, that we see what's going on, and that we go to the and receive mental health services and make this just part of what we do. Like you need to go see a physical doctor. You need to go and see a dentist. You need to go and sometimes have some sort of therapy or possibly even a psychiatrist to just work on your own mental health because as the mind is, so is the rest of the body. Now as a psychiatrist, I think all health starts with behavior in the brain. And how can you be well and not address that primary issue that many of us face? Thanks, Napoleon. And, and uh, I, I did mention um, Mayor Morial's book, and I want to mention a um, um, uh, uh, book that Napoleon has uh, 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 co-authored as well, Mind Matters, uh, a resource guide to psychiatry for Black communities. So I, I will share that with you. And wanted to say to you and um, uh, Anel, I want to come back and ask you about, you, you mentioned um, you know, some of the other uh, areas in terms of the physical health and the mental health, in terms of and 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 uh, now you mentioned culture humility. What I would love to ask you a little bit later is what you're seeing in terms of the pipeline of bringing more professionals of color into the mental health space. Uh, because as uh, most of us as parents, we take our, our youngsters to an ear, nose, and throat specialist, a dentist, uh, a, uh, a primary care physician. When you start looking at the at the field of psychiatry and the field of psychology, what is uh, taking place in terms of intake in that pipeline? So we'll get to that question a little bit later in terms of uh, what you might be able to share uh, in terms of the growth of that. I want to get to JB and Harold now. And to our uh, guest uh, participants, uh, just know we are going to to go to the, the questions in the chat uh, and um, just hang in there with us. We'll get to that in, a, in just a minute. Um, uh, JB, uh, we know that more than half of the PG County, Prince George's County, excuse me, identifies as Black or African American. What needs have you been seeing for this community during this last 19 months? And folks, we've been in COVID for 19 months, uh, almost 20 months. So we're still in it uh, with the uh, with the uh, new variant, the Delta variant. So, um, uh, JB, what have you been seeing, and have the needs changed or grown uh, since uh, since the onset of COVID? Well, thank you for the question, Dan. The needs have certainly grown. More people, for sure, are appearing depressed. Um, they have grief and um, anxiety is high. Uh, we know there's a shortage of psychiatric hospital beds, a shortage of case management services. It's a lack of trauma-informed care, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of un unmet needs, um, shortage of housing, affordable housing, a shortage of emergency housing, transitional housing, supportive housing. I mean, people are calling our helpline constantly looking for those types of resources. Um, there's limited health insurance options or, or coverage. And we, we, we do spend time trying to um, encourage others to um, sign up for the health care. Um, there's a shortage of peer support services. We do the best we can, but there's still gaps in peer support services. And there's a lack of coordinated care. 
People are going from one resource to another, and it seems like all the resources aren't connected, and they're just um, still falling through the cracks in terms of receiving the care and services that they need. Thank you very much, uh, JB. Um, I want to ask a follow-up question. You, you gave some real good insight into housing, supportive, transitional, peer support, coordinating care. Just really this almost like almost like a gap analysis. Mm. Um and, and, and the need for partnerships. Uh, is that conversation happening in Prince George's County? Uh, are those partnerships coming to the table? Uh, because you mentioned the, the, the coordination of care and, and, and that seems to be an area of opportunity. Yes, the, fortunately they are coming to the table because the Prince George's County um, Council actually is very focused right now on trying to um, address all of these issues by saying that in any policy that is proffered or set forth or, or, or is passed, there has to be some consideration of what health needs there are, social health needs that they are, there are. So that's a, that's a good thing. They recently um, commissioned a study that Rand um, accomplished earlier this year, just to identify all the gaps in services. So that's um, one thing that's um, a positive. Also, the health department is working with NAMI Prince George's County um, on a program for um, youth, outreach to transitional age youth. We reach out to youth. We reach out to the elderly. This is also through the health department. It's a great partnership. We work with um, the University of Maryland, the Center of Excellence on Gambling to, to um, reach youth, to sh um, share information about mental health and how it impacts gambling. Um, there, there, there's a definitely a lot of other programs that we are partnering on that is trying to address these shortages and these lack in services. Thank you very much, uh, JB, and appreciate everything that you're doing. I uh, want to move to Harold. And, and Harold, based off of what, and, and by, by the way, JB is the executive director for NAMI uh, for Prince George's County. So um, when we're talking about uh, actually being in the community and doing the work, uh, that is uh, who uh, JB is and what she's doing. Harold, um, uh, Urban LA, um, um, are you seeing similar trends and needs um, uh, on the other side of the country there in Los Angeles? Absolutely. You know, it's, um, you know, we we know pretty much about the, the outcomes of COVID-19 and all the adverse effects that that had, you know, across, across the spectrum. But uh, in particular in Black communities, we know the outcomes have been magnified, you know, within our own communities. So then the next question becomes, you know, once we've identified these, you know, collected from, like you said, the RAND Institute, um, you know, UCLA, uh, the Department of Public Health creates, uh, we kind of refer to them as these misery maps, you know, showing where these disparities exist in the community. But I think we have to move to the next level and look at our system of uh, public health and uh, see how that data is it's being used to build budgets to invest in systems and structure to, uh, to uh, address those disparities. And that's something that we're doing a lot now. It's one thing to know they're there. Uh, how does your budget reflect your commitment to changing it? And that has to be tracked. So it requires us to uh, engage a lot in advocacy and getting involvement from people in the community. You know, how we organize at the community level, how we organize at the service area level. You know, in LA County, we got 11 million people. So we've had eight different service areas with about a million and a half people in each one. And they're all completely different. You know, it's still pretty segregated place. So it's not easy to identify. It's easy to identify where those needs are. You know, and it ties into other things we've looked at, you know, like incarceration, you know, how that affects our communities. You know, lot more to do with. So then we have to look at alternatives to incarceration. Huge program going on in Los Angeles County, 
And uh, NAMI's been involved all the way in making sure that uh, uh, these accurately reflect what we're seeing in the community and hearing from our people in the community. And then, uh, you know, making sure we have the resources available in the community to, to avoid, you know, incarcerations and things like that when people can be treated in the community. So that's another huge, uh, huge uh, undertaking, you know, here in Los Angeles County to address those, what we call the social determinants of mental health, you know, and to build up the capability to do that in the community by investing in small community-based organizations who provide those services, you know, and making it easier for them to uh, be contracted with uh, the larger system of public health, you know, so that uh, that community resource can be fully used and, and mental health care dollars go into the community. And um, I had a thought earlier when, uh, when Anel and I think and Jean were talking as well about, uh, you know, building the workforce. You know, that's huge. You know, we know the, those numbers look horrible for us. But there is, uh, you know, we're lucky in California to have something called the Mental Health Services uh, Act, which is, uh, you know, a big pot of money to do things. Part of that is workforce education and training. You know, if we can see, you know, the shiny castle on the hill of the new mental health system that we want to have, you have to ask yourself, can I get there with the same workforce? <laughs> you know, probably not. Then you have to put plans in place, you know, to recruit, recruit early. Uh, and that involves getting young people involved. That involves getting the schools involved to let them see that there are viable career paths, you know, in the field of mental health and to let them know early enough so that they can plan for that and let them know what resources we're gonna have available to them to correct this imbalance in the system that we see. So uh, there, there's a lot and uh, you know, I could probably go on and I think the basis of that will be with our NAMI on campus programs and building that across the high school and the college levels and um, making sure that uh, we make this a lifetime engagement with advocacy from the high school level, you know, through college, graduation, and community involvement and in providing community services. No, thank you very much, Harold. And what you what you spoke about is is pretty much the whole ecosystem that they almost like constructing a quilt. So it goes back Absolutely. to what Anel said in terms of you know um, um, going upstream and getting to our youth. So it, it's very important. And you also talked about workforce. So I want to go to the to that probe that I left uh, Napoleon and Anel with. Um, 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 uh, Anel, uh, Napoleon, what does it look like in, in terms of creating the pipeline of the next set of professionals uh, in, in mental health? What, what are you seeing? I think things are improving in that area. Uh, I'll give a couple of examples. Uh, there's certainly the consciousness there of the need to increase the pipeline. Um, one example is in Maryland, where I am in Baltimore, Coppin State University has had for many years a program called the Maxi T. Collier Scholars Program, named after the late uh, Black psychiatrist, Dr. Maxi Collier, who was a, a giant in, in mental health in Maryland and nationally. And this program for the last few decades um, has been educating uh, young people um, who are looking for forward to careers in the mental health professions. And, and for those of you who don't know, Coppin State University <coughs> is a historically uh, black college and university. Another example is uh, the work of the American Psychiatric Association, which partnered with Howard University uh, to identify a cadre of uh, black male uh, undergraduate students uh, who were interested in pursuing psychiatry as a field. Uh, and so that uh, program is, is showing uh, great success and promise. And then I would add to that uh, SAMHSA, you know, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration for 
for going on five decades um, has uh, supported the development of, of mental health professionals um, in several fields, uh, in psychiatry, in social work, uh, psychology, uh, I believe um, licensed professional counselors and marital and family therapists, they, were, uh, they came on board maybe in the last uh, five to 10 years. But in any case, this has been a fantastic program that has uh, groomed and supported uh, 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 young people interested in pursuing mental health professions from different disciplines. Um, and it has just been fantastic, the kind of leadership that has come out of these former fellows. And I might add that Dr. Napoleon Higgins uh, is one of the American Psychiatric Association SAMHSA fellows. Um, this program is a national treasure uh, from my standpoint with the kind of leaders that it has produced uh, in a number of fields. And one field that I did not mention is nursing. Uh, the American Nurses Association also has one of these um, of, of SAMHSA fellowships, uh, which has developed uh, nurse nursing professionals who are focused on uh, psychiatry. Many of them have gone on, have gone on uh, doctorate level nurse practitioners. So anyway, there are some good things going on. I think we, we need to do more. These types of programs need to become more widespread. Um, but uh, we're moving in the right direction. And I think there have been some gains, at least in the percentage uh, of psychiatrists of color and, and black psychiatrists included in recent years. Yes. And, you know, as Nell stated, you know, uh, her work, you know, with, you know, with APA and bringing in individuals like myself in that that work matters. Understanding that the books that we are talking about that you showed there, nine out of the 10 individuals who wrote that book were part of that program. And that book is being sold on Amazon today. You know, every month, more and more people are purchasing that and receiving that knowledge and information. I've seen a lot coming out of the colleges with fraternities, sororities, just individual groups um, uh, speaking about mental health. And I've even seen information coming from elementary schools, like talking about mental health and the parts of the brain and how they affect emotions and how you behave. So by getting this information in early and teaching it early as part of regular health, it makes a difference when these individuals grow up and they understand what's going on with them. Well, uh, one book that we, we did do is uh, Bree's Journey to Joy, uh, a story about childhood grief and depression. And oddly enough, this book was supposed to come out early 2020. And we were not able to put it out because of the COVID pandemic. We weren't able to promote it. So we just kind of put it on the back burner. But then as COVID went on, we're writing a book about grief for children and COVID is going. So now the book had to be about COVID. You know, you had to put COVID inside the book. And so by giving children resources to understand what's going on with grief when you lose someone, how to recover from that and understand this, whatever is happening inside of the home is also happening to the child. And too often as adults, we're trying to deal with our own individual issues and we're forgetting the little ones who are in the room. I say kids are like little rubber duckies who are in the bathtub. The water is moving and the duck is just moving around and, and bumping into the walls. But we have to realize that our children are very important. We have to focus on them and we have to start early in doing mental health understanding. Now, there's not enough black psychiatrists there are definitely not enough black male psychiatrists. That's not enough black female psychiatrists. But one thing I've seen is I've seen more black people coming in lately. I've seen more black men coming in. And normally if I saw a black male come in, he was being drugged in by his mom. All right. But now I'm seeing men step forward, realizing that my mental health is not only impacting me, but my mental health is impacting my family. And so the understanding that it's bigger than just me, we need to address these issues and we need to go from not being, you know, we need to go from not just being mentally well, but to having mental wealth, which I say is the ability to have the storehouse that when things happen, that you don't fall down, you don't fall to pieces, but you're not only able to maintain, but you're able to still mentally grow. And we've got to get to the point of not just making it, but by moving forward in our lives uh, so that we can be productive citizens and productive for ourselves and our families. 
Napoleon, first of all, congratulations in terms of being a SAMHSA fellow and um, what you built in terms of your work. Uh, Dr. Prem, in the chat, there are several that have mentioned you as a national treasure. Um, I have been very um, muted in, in talking about you because uh, I, I know you always uh, tell me, Dan, it's not about me, but your mentorship of so many of our young psychiatrists and your mentorship in the mental health space um, for, for years and, and what you continue to do for all of our psychiatrists is just profound uh, and how you've lent your, your expertise in many books. So I wanted to mention that. Um, so, um, you know, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I want to ask uh, Janice something. As you're seeing your work in the high schools, Janice, and you look at this partnership, what's the way forward uh, that you see for us together, NAMI and the Steve Fund? We have over 600 affiliates. Um, that, that that's where the rubber hits the road. They're in the field doing the work in communities across the U.S. And we have 48 state organizations. What do you see as the opportunity with, with the Steve Fund and NAMI uh, coming out of today? Oh, it's an excellent opportunity because it gives us both to be able to share our level of expertise with the information. Uh, I've been working with NAMI for years. Um, with the new program, with the Steve Fund to be able to give us inroads to having groups of kids. Um, this program has been able to be delivered via Zoom or in person. When the schools opened up, we were able to go into the schools, but prior to that time, a lot of the information was gathered via Zoom because working together as a relationship um, would just be an awesome way to reach more kids and more students to be able to talk because they talk just as much as they do via Zoom as they do in person but it allows them to be able to have that one-on-one -on -one contact with their peers. So we've, we've done hybrid sessions as well, where we've had a, a peer counselor that was on where we were in the classroom with the student because she couldn't make it that particular day. So any type of relationship that you have a collaboration, I think between two organizations always gives us a leverage because we're able to reach more people and we're able to share additional information. Um, as a person and a clinician who's treated many, many people, Napoleon and I have shared a lot of patients together um, we're able to talk about things and we're able to share and everybody's expertise becomes important because we're sharing the information on treatment. Uh, because I think first you start with education. Once you educate a group of people about things and why things that may have been said previously are no longer important and giving them options. It's one thing that we always tell people, stop doing something or don't do something or do something new, but without telling them how to do that and giving them the steps in order to achieve that that's not doing a good job. So between us being able to talk about what, what is mental health, why does stigma exist? Let's go ahead and let's erase the stigma because this is the right information. So once you find out what the information is and how that has an impact, you're able to be able to use the steps and things that we give you. So we don't just talk about relaxation. We tell you how to relax. We don't just talk about imaging. We tell you how does that work? You know, How do you breathe? How do you calm yourself down? Parents can learn how to do that for their students and their children, excuse me, for their children, students, teachers. We can start, teachers can start off their day by teaching children how to relax uh, and re re decreasing some of the anxiety. Because realize when um, we were not on an even playing field when the pandemic happened, because a lot of our kids did not have computers. They did not have the internet. They did not have access to a lot of things and there was not a lot of space. So there wasn't space for each person to have their own room to be able to learn. <laughs> saw mm -hmm. a high increase in students that did not finish or did not do well. So thank you. And I want to go to Harold now for a second. Um, Harold, you mentioned a lot of things that are happening in the community and you talked about, and, and then JB, you as well. You know, I always say that, you you know, uh, folks say, well, what, what's going on? I say, well, if you really want to know what people care about, follow the money. So uh, as you, you know, follow the money, because people will talk about it, but if they haven't put the money in, so what are you seeing there on the West Coast in terms of the, uh, are they putting the money in? And then from the money, how is it being operationalized to your view? Is it being operationalized in the black communities in the way it should be? And if not, what's the next step? And, and then JB, love for you to answer that question for Prince George's County. Harold? Yeah. So again, like I said, this should be pretty much data driven you know, to follow that. So you have to collect and have access to the information and also have the relationship with the decision makers, you know, in your local political entity, wherever you know, so happens in Los Angeles, that's the board of supervisors. 
You know, so uh, I and other NAMI members serve on the uh, Los Angeles County Mental Health Commission. So we can ask for those reports, you know, and the results of that data coming in when they uh, come before the commission. The commission's job is to advise and provide oversight to the Department of Mental Health. So we have to make sure that there's that there. And we, we make it a priority when we get together every year and figure out our agenda for the year. It will involve tracking those data and having, having that data broken down so we, ha- we can see what's happening individually in our communities, you know, and what are the plans for, for addressing that. So I'm seeing it make a difference. I'm seeing it make a difference now. I'm seeing um, how the uh, county has committed to building up community resources and investing in doing that and put a mechanism in place for recruiting and training these local community-based organizations to be integrated into the mental health service delivery model. So I'm optimistic about what's going on with that now. And, um, you know, and and we've uh, prioritized those investments in ways that we think would best serve the community as well. So, uh, I'm, I'm pleased with the direction it's going, but uh, we have to be vigilant. You know what, Harold? <laughs> because you're so priorities right. change, be... and we have to make sure they don't change at our expense. Love it. Um, um, uh, priorities change, and don't let them change at our expense. And I love what you shared about data, because data allows us to manage by fact versus assumption or emotion. And, and relationships are critical in navigating and managing those relationships and holding folks accountable with the data, uh, because it, it moves away from assumptions. Um, so data, folks, is, is critically important. I w- want to move to JB and, and get JB's perspective. And these are coast to coast. One is in the mid-Atlantic on the East Coast and one is in on the West Coast. So this is great to hear from both. JB? Sure, Dan. So in Prince George's County, there, there is money flowing in a, in a number of areas. Of course, it could be more, but we're taking advantage of the opportunity to participate and help with respect to um, outreach to citizens who are returning to the community who have mental health problems. We're reaching out to them. There's available resources there. There are also available resources to help train the police on how to de-escalate crisis situations and just how to ensure that there's safety on both sides um, when they come up upon someone who has a mental health condition and is um, in crisis. There's also um, plenty of resources right now to reach out to transitional age youth. Matter of fact, we're working with the health department very closely. I mentioned this earlier on a four-year initiative to um, reach out to those who are transitioning between a youth health care system and an adult health care system, like between the ages of 16 and 21. And our role specifically is to reach out to those who have mental health challenges. And so we are doing that. And um, and I mentioned a crisis initiative. We also taking advantage of that opportunity because they're trying to enhance and, and um, the crisis system here in Prince George's County by improving crisis mobilization. We're even getting a stabilization center over the next year here, and also an ATM system whereby when there is a crisis, ATC system, sorry, when, when there is a crisis, the, the people who are manning the phones or servicing the phones will be able to say where their available beds and where, where the dispatchers can go. So the, those resources are, we feel are helpful for the community. Oh, thank you very much. Um, you know, one of the things for our young people and, 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 and all of our people is, is being able to say, I see you. No, no, I don't see through you. I see you. And sometimes in, in, in the Black community, folks are transparent. It, it looks like they're not there. So this is, this is wonderful because our work is, I see you and there's strength in your vulnerability. And um, so the more that we can um, um, actually support one another, and this is, is incredibly valuable. Um, as we look at this, I wanted to go to a question here. What role, if any, do you think ministry workers can play in caring for the mental health of the Black family? Is spirituality an important aspect of mental health? And that's a, a question that came in. Anybody want to kind of speak to that? Mental health and spirituality go together in the Black community. 
you know, we don't we don't separate the two. If there's an issue or a problem or depression or, you know, you folk give their testimony in front of the church and all these things uh, happen. So ministers are very important, especially for even spreading the information and spreading the word uh, to the to the to the black community. Now, one thing that we've kind of lost in the definition of psychiatry, psych means the spirit, the wind of the individual. Iatry is the treatment of the spirit or the win of the individual. Now, so often we talk about psychiatry being the treatment of mental health, but really you're treating the spirit and the win of the individual, which goes well beyond medications. It many times goes well beyond therapy. There are so many things that goes into that spirit and win. What you eat, how you sleep, you know, sunlight, the people around you, the loved ones, support, care, finances, money, all of those things go into the spirit and the win. And so with that is the, the spirituality of us as a people. And that's going to be very important in that we don't separate the two. And many times our pastors and our churches are the first, first level of care. We don't go to the call to police normally when the boy is say the young man is acting up. We don't, we don't even call a therapist if we have marital issues. You know, we go to the pastor uh, many times of our churches. And the fact is that they need to be equipped with the information to know what is their portion in, underst- in helping with mental health, but also when to refer out. And I found that when I talk to pastors about, about mental health, they are all ears because right now we are struggling as a people with everything going on. And those people are in church. If there's any place that we're gathered, we are in church, you know, and now, now, and I can't say that all black people go to church, but about 90% of us are affiliated with some sort of uh, spiritual institution, be it a church or a mosque or a temple. We are a spiritual people. And it's important that we have those coalitions working together uh, so that we could be well mentally. Thanks, Napoleon. Anyone else want to address that question? Uh, this is Harold. Yeah, we have a very strong relationship with our faith-based community. And uh, we actually have quite a few pastors who are NAMI teachers and facilitators, you know, not because they are pastors, but because they have family members who are ill and who have struggled and they qualify under the, you know, all the requirements of our program. And they are committed to it for that reason. You know, they came to NAMI like most of us do. You know, I came because, uh, you know, I had a family member who was ill you know, looking for connection to resources, um, you know, for understanding, for education. And uh, I think, you know, the community has been very open, uh, the faith-based community, to collaborating with NAMI and including us, you know, in their activities and approaches. And, you know, we often attend events that are put on by the faith-based communities. But, uh, um, you know, we don't, adhere to any one philosophy or anything like that. And we're very clear about that when we engage with them, you know, if they choose to come on and volunteer with us, you know, to be teachers and facilitators that, uh, you know, they have to assume that we have a lot of believers and non-believers alike. And our idea is to be inclusive. And, And we've frankly never had a problem with that you know, crossing those lines at all, just being open, you know. Uh, one, of, one of the things that we know is that in the faith-based community, um, and we've known it for years, that a lot of times this is the, where the, we call them the first responders. So, uh, and, and, and being those first responders, what does that look like? Now, they may be leading their congregation, their flock, if you will, uh, their, 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 their um, constituents, but at the same time, they are first responders. So many times they need care. Um, on, and, and they need some Absolutely. insulation so that they can, because they get exhausted. Now, last up to now through COVID, there's been over 700,000 deaths disproportionately in communities of color in the Black community. We have multi generational uh, families in, in, in homes. So the pain and the fear and, and, and just the exhaustion, the economic exhaustion of, of losing a job to COVID, and then the fear of is, is is am I going to lose my my granddad, my grandma, or my mother, or my father, uh, and 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 just what's going on there? How, what what have you all seen in terms of in our community in terms of uh, mental mental health and 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 just the anxiety and and the concerns uh, navigating COVID? Uh, during COVID, I also ran a hotline for our school district here in Houston, as well as for the city of Houston. 
Mm. And a lot of our calls that were coming in were directed from people of color who were asking for help. Um, there was a major, major outcry because they realized they needed support and they did not know what to do. So we had parents that were calling in. We also had children and adolescents that were calling in for help. So the need and the suicide rate was quite, it, it grew, but we were able to stop a lot of people and have services at, arrive at their homes. So we had the HPD was involved. And so we were sending people out to facilitate them getting to psychiatric hospitals and things of that nature. So there was a lot of trauma and stress and anxiety that people experienced during, during COVID, um, but yet they were willing to reach out. And with the faith-based community, they've had, they have mental health moments now in churches on Wednesday, um, which I think is awesome because it, several years back, as long as I've been practicing, I've never seen that kind of collaboration. And everybody realizes that we all need each other from whatever discipline we're coming from. So um, there was a need and people were, were actually given a lot of resources uh, as far as to reach out. So there's still, the need is still high because traditionally we use the uh, emergency room for services. So we were trying to get people to different spaces and get them in counseling, you know, without having to use it. Because by the time they get to the emergency room, they're at a, a peak to where they're, you know, maybe in a psychosis or needing additional services. So they were calling in and talking. Men were calling in and talking, um, which was something quite unusual. We have a lot of numbers of things that we were able to do. So adolescents, children, men, women, adults, families were calling. So it, it, it turned out to be really a good avenue for people. Thank you for staffing or running that hotline. I, I know that can can just be exhausting from the standpoint of the stories you hear and how can you get them help and they need it right away. So um, thank you for, for doing that. Um, let me ask a, another question to the entire panel, and it's about access and resources. So you can say access to resources, but available resources and then access. Um, we know that insurance can be a, a challenge. We also know that access and then navigating uh, to get to that access and knowing how to. Uh, what, have you seen a model uh, in any community that is uh, kind of um, uh, all encompassing and is doing it well? Uh, so a best practice. And then what do you see as the opportunity going forward to help our community know how to access uh, and what are the available resources? Uh, and that's open to, to any and all of the panelists. So access and resources. And I know there were great challenges during COVID, um, um, but there were challenges going into COVID. Uh, the demand for services was high and the supply of, of available talent and resources was low. So we know that it actually multiplied during COVID. So what, what are you seeing right now in terms of access um, and then navigating to resources? This is JB, Dan. I will just say that, you know, COVID hit Prince George's County pretty hard. Like one in four people that got COVID in the state of Maryland comes from Prince George's County. So the nav navigating the behavioral health system is already a challenge. Things just got worse. People mm -hmm. just got even more overwhelmed with trying to find out which way to go. And they're expressing one crisis after the other. They are almost like living in crises, going from one to the other. And then when they reach out to, to social services or places for help, a lot of times um, they're not given the attention that they need, you know, because these people who actually do this work have seen this over and over, you know, the people are coming to them all the time. And so it's almost like minimized some of the issues that they have. And so they just continue to go from crisis to crisis. Another reason why um, spirituality is so important in the church, we do conduct, conduct outreach to the churches and they are partners with us. And so that's a great help in terms of getting the message out to um, people who are distressed about the services that we provide, about the education that we could give them, about the support that we can give them. Thank you very much. I mm -hmm. uh, appreciate that. Anyone else uh, want to uh, enter into that uh, um, resources uh, and access? This is Harold again. You know, yeah, I worry about access. I also worry about the quality of that access. And it actually preceded COVID. You know, and I walk into the mental health clinic in the community where I'm in the first thing I'm seeing is an armed guard there. You know, I, um, you know, I want to demilitarize the mental health setting. 
You know, when I walk into the Hall of Administration for county meetings, you know, there's no guard there wanting me and doing all those things. It doesn't feel like a place where I'm going to get help. You know, and uh, I'm undiagnosed. So, uh, you know, and I don't feel welcome there. Uh, I, I struggle with that and, and uh, it's become an advocacy issue for me. But, you know, the appropriateness of the service that you get, you know, whether it's welcoming or not, you know, going to be um, a factor in whether people will return there for services. Yeah. So Thank access you. is a real big issue that we have to keep bringing up. And um, because that's just one of the many things that's wrong, you know, and the other thing we talked about was uh, uh, alternative crisis response. You know, in LA County, you know, one of the things we were doing to get on the road to do that, we actually ordered, uh, you know, 10 vans to be out in the community, being able to pick up people and transport them in a dignified way to services. But, you know, they came with big mental health signs on the side of it. (laughs) Nobody was going to get in there, you know, see your neighbors getting in there. (laughs) You know, this is, you know, that just, how would you expect that to work? You know, it only adds to the stigma and the resistance to it. So a little thought needs to come in, a little more collaboration with our peers and families who've been directly impacted by these things to uh, really validate that we're moving in the right direction with these services as we bring them in. Thank you, Harold. Um, Dr. Prim? Yes, I just wanted to add that one, I'll say positive side effect of COVID was the um, emergence of telehealth uh, as a way for people to access mental health services. And um, from the people that I provide psychiatric services to, they've been very happy about that. It's been very convenient for them, uh, you know, for those who had access either through a laptop or their phones. You know, most people have phones. I know not everyone does uh, have a, a smartphone, um, but even people with a telephone um, were able to access mental health resources because of the public health emergency that the country was in. And so, you know, especially for people who already had a relationship with a mental health professional, you know, it was a seamless transition um, to the the telehealth. Um, There may have been challenges elsewhere, but I think overall people have learned that uh, telehealth opened the door for more people to receive services. They could stay in their homes. They did not have to walk into a building that said community mental health center. And so, you know, for those who were concerned about the stigma um, and, and for those for which the stigma was a barrier, I feel like telehealth reduced the barriers. So that, that's been a big plus. And I think that's resulted in an increase of uh, people having access to mental health services at a time when the, the, the needs and the demand were very great. Thank you. And you're right. Telehealth has been um, in, in, in an incredible asset and a lift. And we've even seen the fact that now we give folks the option of do you want audio only or do you want audio and video? And that has actually helped uh, increase uh, the, the utilization because you have people saying, you know, I could do it just voice. Um, and, 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 and it's it's increased their consistency of utilize, uh, utilizing uh, uh, telehealth and, and telepsychiatry. Um, uh, we have about five minutes uh, before we go to the, the next topic. So I wanted to give everybody an opportunity to say what um, and maybe even uh, address an answer to a question I haven't asked, uh, because I, I'm, I'm not sure of all of the real questions that should be asked, because there's so many that I have that I'd love to get your insight on. So is there anything that in the last five minutes you'd love to share with the audience? Dan, this is Harold, and just uh, to chime in on a last bit of information, I think, you know, dealing with the COVID and the COVID response and all of that has really um, pushed the envelope when it comes to exactly what we're doing here today, trying to build partnerships, because um, it's really hard, you know, to get access, as we were talking about, especially in in the communities that we serve, but 
you know, through, but through getting grants and partnering with another, other community-based organizations who have that as their focus, bridging the digital divide in communities of color and collaborating and working with them along with our funders to make sure we can provide that connectivity for people who come for services. You know, and uh, it, it's extremely important as I, I think that uh, because we can't provide everything, they could provide the technical expertise as well as the multi-language capability that's important in our community. We have a lot of Spanish speaking clientele. It's about half the services that we deliver. So, um, you know, to have that um, direction sort of spurred on by our COVID response has been very, very important. And even working with our, our state organization, NAMI California, who's done job, done uh, yeoman's work as uh, getting us involved in doing non-clinical counseling in response to COVID, where we can dispatch people from our affiliate out in the community. And that's been very successful. And we use a lot of peers in that, in that effort as well. Thank you, Harold. I mentioned earlier that NAMI Prince George's County is working on a um, system of care for transitional age youth opportunity. And I wanted to stress that the initiative is youth and family led and youth and family driven. And this is very important for any programming about youth and their families. Thank you. Thank you very much, JB. And Janice, you'll have the last comment, and then we're going to move to a video from U.S. Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman. Very important video. So Janice, last word. Okay, last word is that for our youth, and I, I appreciate JB making that statement, but the Steve Fund, we have uh, different webinars that are online called uh, Young, Gifted, and Well for Family Members that are geared toward family members and resources. So I think that that's important. Uh, you can go on, uh, families can also go online and info at Steve Fund where they, if they want to be a part of our well-being and color program. And our adolescents are not only using the, the video, they're also texting information. So we can text and communicate with therapists as well. So that helps as far as their generation and what they prefer to do. Um, so we have a lot of resources, not only with telehealth and telemental health, but the ability to be able to text. So if uh, families are interested in going to the Steve Fund, uh, our website, and then that for you can see all the resources that we have. Uh, but the Young, Gifted, and Well Family um, webinars are very, very, very uh, helpful. And they're 45 minutes long. And so people can access that at any time. So that's all so I just please want to go. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Um, and um, please go, audience, please go, and participants, please go to stevefund.org and also go to nami.org. We have incredible resources with both, and we would love to make sure that you're accessing both. Uh, just as a point of information for the questions that we weren't able to get to uh, in terms of in the chat, we will uh, uh, collect those and we will try and get back to you. One of those, Janice, was they love the experience that you have in the program you're taking to the children, and they wanted to know uh, um, how, if you knew if that was going back to the parents and some other questions about that. So we, we will try and get to those. This is the beginning of an incredible relationship and us looking to actually operationalize this partnership. So um, uh, this is just the beginning, folks. So with that said, I'd like to transition now. And thank you, panelists. Um, uh, just wonderful discussion and, 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 and incredible uh, knowledge that you shared. So now let's go uh, to uh, the video from U.S. Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman. I'm Bonnie Watson Coleman, representing New Jersey's 12th Congressional District. I'd like to start by thanking the Steve Fund and the National Alliance on Mental Illness for hosting an event on such a crucial topic. In recent studies, data has indicated an alarming increase in the suicide rates for black children and teenagers over the last generations. To better understand this data, two years ago, my office launched the Congressional Black Caucus Emergency Task Force on Black Youth Suicide and Mental Health. For eight months, the task force held hearings, forums, listening sessions, and events that shed light on the need for resources for awareness, for research, and for education. The report that followed inspired the Pursuing Equity in Mental Health Act that I first authored in the 116th Congress. 
The findings of the report highlight the racial disparities in mental health resources and the disproportionate disciplinary sanctions and referrals that are faced by black youth in schools. This information should serve as an urgent call to action for all Americans to reverse the trends for suicide and ensure that black children and teens are receiving and engaged in mental health care, we must continue to have these difficult but necessary conversations. We must continue to pursue equity in mental health because the systems that we have in place simply do not address the mental health needs for all communities. We must have these conversations until every individual, regardless of race, gender, and socioeconomic status, has affordable access to resources and treatment. Thank you once again for inviting me into this space to address this important issue, and thank you for all you're doing, such great work to elevate the mental health needs in our communities. Well, we just we, we really want to uh, thank Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman, and uh, hopefully this audience is aware of a body of work. Uh, this is about resources as well, and, and in these partnerships, I'm going to share this, but hopefully someone will put it in the chat. Ring the alarm, the crisis of black youth suicide in America. And this was a task force that was commissioned and convened by the Congressional Black Caucus and Representative uh, Bonnie Watson Coleman was the task chair. And I'll hold it up one more time, ring the alarm. Very important body of work. So um, um, we really appreciate her uh, doing that video for us. Now what I'd like to do is to welcome and to have you hear from uh, Ellis Gordon Jr., uh, the former husband of the late B.B. Moore Campbell, and his thoughts on mental health in the Black family. And for you all that don't know, I, I keep doing this with books. 72 Hour Old uh, is one of B.B.'s books. I had the pleasure of, of actually meeting her long before I uh, was ever here. I met her uh, on uh, and, and had dinner with her and, and a few others on June 30th of 2005. And she uh, signed this for me. And I've been here 20 months at NAMI, so didn't know that in 2005, that in 2020 and 2021, I would be doing this work. So with that said, somebody who knows uh, what mental health in the Black family is, should be, and the connective tissue, um, it is Ellis Gordon Jr. Ellis? Hello, everyone. I'm here with Ellis Gordon Jr., former husband of the late B.B. Moore Campbell advocate, writer, journalist, author, and co-founder of NAMI Urban Los Angeles. Ellis, you and BB raised two children, Ellis III and Maya, and began a journey that involved confronting not just mental illness, but also stigmas and uninformed conversations in society. Have you seen a shift in how we discuss mental health in Black families? Yes, I have. I, I think what has happened over for the last 20 years uh, due to uh, BB's pioneering work with regard to destigmatizing mental illness, uh, more people are becoming, uh, well, more Black people are becoming more forthright uh, and I, identifying what those problems are so they can deal with them. I think when we started this journey uh, back in 1995, uh, the stigma was so great that we wouldn't even tell family members that we had a family member that had a mental illness. So I, I think we've come a long ways from there, but there's still a long ways to go. But what BP had done going back to uh, like the early 2000s, late, late 1990s and early 2000s. And I, and I just think that it, it's a matter of, of educating younger people that the things that they're doing have been done in the past. And we have a pioneer that, that did that. And the reason it's important to, to keep her name there is that we don't want to revise history. She started doing this, uh, like I said, over 20 years ago. And I think that it's important because of the fact that she put a spotlight on it. I, I think that's one of the reasons why it has become so prevalent in, uh, in our thoughts today, because of the fact that she was a pioneer of uh, putting that forth and making sure that uh, the stigma of mental illness would be erased. And thank you for pointing out that it's a resolution, not a law. And the reason why that's important is because uh, our government did recognize it wasn't about a law or anything like that. It was about actually recognizing what advocacy looks like. And and B.B. Moore Campbell embodied that. And uh, I want to thank you for giving her a voice here, as well as your family. 
Um, I know that you and your family continue to the effort. Is, is there any advice you have? Um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about your, your family and current work if you care to. But is there any advice you have for families that um, need to talk about this? And I've got another book here, uh, Sometimes My Mommy Gets Angry, that helps spur the conversation for Black families that uh, lived with the experience of mental illness and all it brings. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it's important. My my current wife is Abigail, Abby uh, Smith Gordon has been uh, in lockstep with me with regard to advocating for uh, erasing the stigma of a mental illness. There are many uh, family to family classes we have that teach families how to cope with a, a family member that has mental illness. They well as support groups that provide support. Uh, and resources make them aware of what's out there so that when their loved one does encounter a problem, they have uh, readily at their disposal uh, resources that they can contact and get help for the uh, loved one. And I think that that's the difference between now and when we started this this uh, you know, this journey over 20 years ago. There, uh, there are more resources out there and it's, it's more prevalent in, in today's thought. And we got more people that are addressing it and looking to make sure that it, it it's it's on parity with with physical health because it's like if you have diabetes, you just take the medication. It, it it's not something that can be cured, but it can be managed. And it's the same thing with mental illness. Uh, it's not necessarily totally curable, but it, it can be managed through medication, through psychotherapy, and through all the other resources that are out there. And I think it's important for uh, all members of all communities to be aware of what resources are out there and uh, take advantage of them. Well, I think something you said here today is going to help an individual and hopefully an entire family that um, that may benefit from the resources you listed. I want to thank you again for giving us your time and inviting us uh, into your work and your life and um, and BB's work as well in her legacy. And for that, uh, we're all grateful. Thank you so much. Well, well, thank you so much. And also, you know, what we've done, we, we formed a task force uh, on the BB Moore Campbell uh, National Mental Health a Minority Mental Health Awareness Month Task Force. And that our goal is to make sure that we erase the stigma, but not her name. And you've given us a call to action, which is uh, the, always the best way to end these types of discussions. So thank you for that, Mr. Gordon. Thank you. And you just uh, heard from uh, Ellis Gordon Jr. as well as Sherman Gillums Jr., our Chief uh, Strategy and Operations Officer. And uh, appreciate uh, uh, that uh, uh, conversation, uh, Ellis and Sherman, uh, very much. And now we'd like to go to the wrap up with uh, Gordon Bell. Um, so, Gordon. Thank you so much, Dan. This has been an outstanding afternoon. Thank you to all of our brilliant panelists, professionals, people who are out there making the change and making the difference. You know, this sounded incredibly complicated at moments between COVID and is the money going the right place and how complicated it is and stigma. And yet I kept hearing that call to action. Dan, kudos for developing the themes and the conversation that made me feel empowered. We are gonna use the best thinking that we can find from leaders like Dr. Anil Prim. We're gonna know the drivers, what's happening on the ground, JB, uh, Dr. Napoleon, uh, uh, Higgins, uh, Janice Beal, working with our young people. We're gonna get active and drive forward to make the change. And if we clarify, but what can I do today? What good can I do today? An old Ben Franklin quote, then we can do something here and now. So it is a great pleasure for me to say thank you CEO of NAMI, Dan Gillison, thank you to our friends and panelists. You guys are amazing resources for our community and we thank you for your incredibly powerful work. We're going forward and we're gonna reduce the stigma about mental health the way we've reduced the stigma about other things in society. We're moving this thing forward. We've got the tools, the connectivity. We got Zoom meetings with over 500 people, over 520 at the peak. We are making the difference here and now today. So leave enlightened. Thank you so much.